Hello ladies and gentlemen, I'm Matt from Matt's Book Michelle, and today we are continuing our Road to Ulysses series. Not too many stops left before we actually get to Ulysses, but as you'll see today we have a bit of an unexpected uh, stop in this long, long road. And that stop is Giacomo Joyce. When I did my announcement video, I had no idea that this work existed. I've said the story before, but in case you don't know, I went to a bookstore with my two friends, Colorless Wonderland and Dronzo. They legally changed their names to those two of their YouTube usernames, in case you didn't know. But we were exploring, you know, this bookstore. It's a third bookstore. It's a very big one. And I was in the Joyce section because, you know, why not? And I was just looking through what they had and past the shelf in, like, the, the dark sort of dusty area after the books, I found this. And I, like, you know, I uncovered the dust like it was something from, like, an Indiana Jones movie. And I found Giacomo Joyce. And it's not particularly surprising why people don't know about this because Giacomo Joyce is an unfinished manuscript by James Joyce. But now having read it several times, I can honestly say that I really wish this, whatever this is supposed to be, you know, saw its true potential because what we have here, I think is pretty brilliant and I can't help but speculate as to what could have been had Joyce decided to finish it. So with that being said, what is Giacomo Joyce? Well, it's kind of hard to explain because, as I said, it's unfinished. We don't really know exactly what it was going to be, but from what we have here, I'll try to do my best to explain what is present. So first, we need to go through what the book actually looks like. Just going to throw it out there. This is not including the introduction. The actual manuscript itself is 15 pages long, but if you'll see in the text itself, there are a lot of spaces. So I think if we were to actually line up all the text in a you know, normal way, this would maybe be nine pages, and I'm being kind of generous with that. But also this book is cool because you get Joyce's actual writing of the manuscript. You got, you know, photocopy versions of it, which is also very cool. Before I go into the actual plot of the book, I want to go briefly into Richard Elman's introduction. If you don't know who Richard Elman is, he is a biographer for Joyce, so he knows his stuff with this regard. He describes the book as followed. A love poem, which is never recited. It is Joyce's attempt at the sentimental education of a dark lady, his farewell to a phase of his life, and at the same time, his discovery of a new form of imaginative expression. So the introduction, I think, is almost worth it alone. He goes into depth as to, you know, where Joyce was at this point, what he was thinking, who he was talking to, and even explains some of the characters who are, you know, clearly the, the, the fill-ins for Giacomo Joyce and the people in this manuscript. Before we can actually get to the historical characters, I think it's necessary to explain what the plot is. So the plot follows a English tutor living in Trieste and Padua, it switches locations at one point, and then back, starts in Trieste, goes to Padua, and then back to Trieste, and the protagonist's name is Giacomo, but interestingly enough, he refers to himself as Jamesy and James several times throughout the manuscript. And during this time, he, his, um, a young Italian student catches his eye. He follows her in kind of weird ways. I, I don't know if it's following. Again, it's very unclear. It's at, sometimes, at some points it's following, but it's also unclear at other points whether she knows he's there or not. So, you know, take that as you will. But they, he meets this girl, he meets his father, and he's, you know, in love with her. But he has to deal with the, the, the morality of cheating on his spouse because he, he Giacomo is married or is you know in a relationship with someone else at this time and as the manuscript goes on he goes to Padua with this girl and he's you know completely smitten by her and then towards the end of the manuscript they hook up it's unclear if it's the first time that they actually hook up but it's the most definite time they hook up which is at the end and after that literally the paragraph after she's kind of embarrassed by him and she wants nothing to do with him and Giacomo feels very disillusioned with the whole ship as it unfolds and he sort of reflects on himself and he feels bad for his wife who he calls Nora which is James Joyce's actual wife and it kind of ends with him sort of reflecting on the fact that he's getting older because at this time Joyce was in his early 30s when he was writing this and that is kind of the best way I can explain the manuscript I'm sorry if it's very vague but you gotta read it in order to understand how, how little they kind of give you here. But I think it's barely enough to sink your teeth into, and having read it multiple times, it made sense to me. The first time I read it, it made no sense to me, but as I kept rereading it and started going more into what Jobus is going through at this time, it started to make more sense to me. And I can almost say this is a, was, would be a complete short story if there was just a little more information given, and I 
dearly wishes for more information given here because I love it. I love what he gave us. But as we've gone through with other Joyce works, his what he writes is very much autobiographical and just changes the names of the people and probably some minor plot points that go on. And that is very much the case here. As In fact, I'd probably say Giacomo Joyce is James Joyce's most personal work. So the woman, the, this student who Joyce pursues, is a real person, or maybe several people. One person for sure that we know he's talking about is a woman named Amalia Popper, who studied in Trieste. And it is, according to Richard Elman, the biographer, they probably had the relationship between 1907 and 1909, because in 1909, Amalia left to Vienna to study for university, and eventually moved to Florence where she would get married and, you know, live a fairly normal life up until 1967 when she died. But considering that Giacomo Joyce was written in 1914, which is after Dubliners and during the time of his writing the portrait of the artist as a young man, there's some implications that there were other girls he may have pursued at this time as well. But Amalia is sort of the, the key figure in the Italian girl, as you will, that is in the manuscript. But interestingly enough, Ellerman points out that Amalia's father's name is Leopoldo. So obvious parallels to Leopold Bloom. So you'd have to wonder if Leopold Bloom from Ulysses was actually inspired by Amalia's father. So that's even more reference, even more significance to his time in Trieste. So with some of the history out of the way, let's actually get into the text of Giacomo Joyce itself. It kind of stands out to me personally as the biggest fluctuation, if you will, between, you know, richer, more Shakespearean prose and the sort of crazy sort of train of thought style that that James Joyce would be known for via Ulysses. And there's bits of it in portrait as well. But this is sort of the biggest example of a go between between the prose of Dubliners, which is more traditional and traditional for, you know, Joyce because he's a great, he's, he's a great, um, prose writer, but, you know, more traditional prose in Dubliners and the more unique prose that he has, the more sporadic prose in Ulysses. And for the most part, I would say that it works because of this dreamlike haze. It really feels like Joyce is talking to you, like you're reading his thoughts as he's exploring this mental exercise and going back in time to, you know, look upon himself during a period that is both sort of shrouded in like fantasy and, you know, lust and romance, but also a sort of hint of regret and a hint of the fact that he's getting older and there's some grosser imagery in it as well. So it's a really interesting amalgamation of the two styles that he is known for. So to give you a good example of how the prose fluctuates, I'm gonna read the first couple pages of Giacomo Joyce so you can see for yourself how sort of sporadic and how sort of, you know, unhinged his writing style is at this point in this manuscript. Who, a pale face surrounded by heavy odorous furs. Her movements are shy and nervous. She uses quizzing glasses. Yes, a brief syllable, a brief laugh, a brief beat of the eyelids. Cobweb handwriting, traced long and fine, with quite disdain and resignation, a young person of quality. I launch forth on an easy wave of tepid speech. Swedenborg, the pseudo Aeropagite, Miguel de Molinos, Joaquim Abbas. The wave is spent. Her classmate, retwisting her twisted body, purrs in boneless Viennese Italian. Che cultura! The long eyelids beat and lift. A burning needle prick stings and quivers in the velvet iris. High heels clack, hollow on the resonant stone stairs. Wintry air in the castle. Gibbeted coats of mail. Rude iron sconces over the windings of the winding turret stairs. Tapping, clacking heels, a high and hollow noise. There is one below would speak with your ladyship. Padua, far beyond the sea, a silent middle age, night, darkness of history, sleep, in the Piazza della Erbe, under the moon, the city sleeps, under the arches in the dark streets, near the river, the whore's eyes spy out for fornicators, cinque servizi per cinque franchi, a dark wave of sense again and again and again. Mine eyes fail in darkness, mine eyes fail, mine eyes fail in darkness, love. Again, no more dark love dark longing, no more darkness. So yes, that's kind of how the manuscript plays out prose-wise. I do like the idea of the castles being described in different ways. 
so in that first part that I read, there's clear like sh there's clear like typical prose of how you describe a castle. It's very detailed, very almost chivalric. And then you get the more frantic describing of the city of Padua later on in that second part that I read. And it feels more like you're getting Hughes himself observing the setting rather than some omnipresent third person narrative observing and describing the, the, the setting that he's in. And it also mirrors Portrait of the Arts as a Young Man, where Stephen Dedalus, when he first comes to Dublin, was hiring prostitutes to have sex with. And you see Tia Como here doing the same exact thing. Potentially, we don't know. He, there's no evidence that he went through with it but there is evidence that he's pointing it out, so it is, of, it is of significance. I rush out of the tobacco shop and call her name. She turns and halts to hear my jumbled words of lessons. Hours, lessons, hours, and slowly her pale cheeks are flushed with a kindling opal light. Nay, nay, be not afraid. Mio padre, she does the simplest act of distinction. Unde derivator, mia filia ha una grandissima amorazione per il suo maestro inglese which, if you do not speak Italian, means my daughter has a deep appreciation for her English professor. The old man's face, handsome, flushed with strongly Jewish features and long white whiskers, turns towards me as he walks down the hill together. Oh, perfectly said, courtesy, benevolence, curiosity, trust, suspicion, naturalness, helplessness of age, confidence, frankness, urbanity, sincerity, warning, pathos, compassion, a perfect blend, Ignatius Loyola, Make haste to help me. So in addition to the Leopold Bloom slash Leopoldo Amalia's father references, Leopoldo is Jewish like Leopold Bloom. I think they have different facial hair though, but they both come from, you know, Jewish, they both come from Jewish descent, which is important, you know, parallel, I would say. And yeah, more of Joyce's sporadic prose. It's like being in the presence of this woman makes him nervous or excited and reflects that in the more sporadic, more pedantic writing style that you see here. And just, I think it's sort of supposed to reflect what the character is thinking in that moment. And it's interesting, like the listing of just adjectives and feelings. It's sort of like a beginner's guide or like a an early template of what Joyce would do later on with Portrait and Ulysses with the with his you know, train of thought writing style. It's sort of like the the more bare bones version of that because in Ulysses there's a lot of listing. It's a lot of listing things that I do not quite understand. <laughs> and as I said earlier, the relationship does not last particularly long, both in real life and in the manuscript. They definitely hook up towards the end and then after that moment there's sort of an embarrassment from Amalia. I'm gonna call her Amalia, but it's the the Italian student. And then Giacomo kind of becomes disillusioned with her, and he calls her, you know, wintry and venomous, and he sort of he sort of completely is, you know, detached from her at this point, and in that point, he sort of reflects on his own immorality in this time, and this is the most, I would say, obvious, but maybe some would say egregious reference to real life, and I'll read that part as followed. I burn, I crumple like a leaf, from my right armpit, a fang of flames leaps up. A starry snake has kissed me. A cold night snake. I am lost. Nora. And yes, Nora is, as I said, the wife of James Joyce. And that is the most obvious way to, to completely shred any disillusion that Giacomo is not James Joyce because they literally have the same name. That their wives are literally have the same name. It is James Joyce. There is no way to potentially get away from that. And then on the last page of the manuscript, you get his longing for youth and his acceptance that he is now getting older. And I'll read the passage as followed. Youth has an end. In the vague mist of old sounds, a faint point of light appears. The speech of the soul is about to be heard. Youth has an end. The end is here. It will never be. You know that well. What then? Write it. Damn you, write it. What else are you good for? And that pretty much marks the end of Giacomo Joyce. Not a whole lot to work with, but from what we get, I really, really appreciated it and admired it because the writing style is great. The story is interesting, if not, you know, sketchy, but... So to conclude this analysis of Giacomo Joyce, I want to go into reasons as to why James may have not decided to publish it. So it was written between Dubliners and Portrait of the Artist's Young Man, and it even references, and there's even a scene in this manuscript where he has Amalia read Portrait, and she doesn't really like it, and he gets mad. So it's pretty funny in itself. And I could see him writing Portrait and deciding that that book is more important to him. He might have liked it more and then decided to go with it. 
Gia Coleman Joy stands out from his other fictional works because, as far as I'm aware, it's the only one he's written that does not take place in Ireland. So perhaps when writing it, he felt out of his own element, and Richard Ellerman goes into that topic as followed. Joyce's prose writings are so committed to an Irish scene that among them, Giacomo Joyce is distinct in being set on the continent. The city of Trieste, like Dublin, is presented obliquely, but unlike Dublin, with only occasional place names. An upland road, a hospital, a piazza, a market appear deliberately unidentified. Yet, they come into being as the girl or her family passes through them. The city is made recognizable with its up and down streets, the brown overlapping tiles of its roofs, the cimitero is realitico, the nationalistic chafing at Austro-Hungarian rule. Against it are counterposed images, not only of Paris as in Ulysses, but also of Padua and of the rice country of Vercelli. So it's not hard to imagine that Joseph's writing this and did not feel particularly comfortable with how it came out, considering the fact that when you read Dubliners, when you read Portrait of the Young Man, you read Ulysses, he goes very specifically into where the characters are in Dublin because he knows the city so well. Whereas here in Padua and in Fieste, you don't really get that sort of detail. You get detail, you get visual detail, but not for not specific location details. So maybe there he felt like the manuscript was lacking as well. And perhaps the final reason as to why Joyce probably did not want this published is because, at least as far as I'm aware, as far as I've read, this truly feels like Joyce's most personal work. It just feels like his diary. In many ways, there is like legitimate recollection of events. I would almost definitely say it's his most autobiographical as well. You have him calling himself Jamesy. You have him himself calling himself Jim. You have his wife, Nora's name mentioned. You have, based on Richard Ellerman's accounts, fairly, fairly accurate fictionalized versions of real historical events that took place in James's life. And I would say that perhaps he maybe got cold feet while writing it, realizing that it was way too autobiographical for his own good and or way too personal. And maybe he just didn't want his emotions in that sort of vulnerable state out there for the public to read. And that would probably be my guess, ultimately. I'd say probably a combination of all three that I mentioned, but I would say maybe that was the driving force behind it all because this is very personal. You really feel like you're getting into James Lewis's head with this work. And with that said, that is my wrap-up of Gia Coleman Joyce. If you want to read more about Amalia Popper, she has a Wikipedia page, but it is in Italian, and as far as my way, you cannot translate it. So just gonna look up for that. Maybe you have Google Translate. But I kind of speak Italian. I kind of read Italian, so I didn't have too much of a problem. I had a little bit of a problem. I had significant problems trying to translate it. But that, that's not, that is beside the point. Yeah, so next up is Dubliners, which I have right here. This is actually like his first published work, well, at least um, like fictional story work, prose work, so I probably should have started with this, but I didn't. But I have it finished, I'm going to do a video on it at some point, and then after that, we'll be getting into Ulysses, which I'm going to break kayfabe for a second and say that I have already started it. I'm going to do a big like announcement video or whatever later on, but I have started it, so if you want to start Ulysses to read along with me, I suggest doing it. I will be putting out more videos on Road to Ulysses more often for the time being. And yeah, let me know what you think of Giacomo Joyce. If you read it, let me know if I did a good job, you know, describing this manuscript. It's very complicated. So yeah, I definitely had some difficulty trying to piece the events together, but I think it's ultimately worth reading if you can find it. I had no idea this existed until I went to the third bookstore and I'm glad that I found it. I'm glad that I read it because there is a lot, a lot to like about Giacomo Joyce. So thank you for making it this far, and I hope to see you in my Dubliners video. Check out my other Road to Ulysses videos if you're new to the series. And yeah, Ulysses, Ulysses will be on its way as well, so very exciting. And thank you for making it this far, and goodbye.